just put it on my mail. Um, yeah, that's it. Very good. That's a little bit of fun. Control L is to zoom. Control L is to uh, full screen. Are you on going out already? Well, well, no. I am, but I need to get to grab the link to share it. Yeah, or you can put it listed. Pre present to everyone. Uh, and that's easier. Public. Public, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the easiest thing, so we don't have to do another change. And we're almost ready to go. We are with, still within the academic delay. Because then I can't touch the screen anymore. So I just need to make sure that I have the link. True. Um, if I see anything public here. Um, okay, let me grab the link. Mm -hmm. okay. View on page. See, it's, it's actually live. I'm just going to. Control C. Thank you. Oh, yes. Now it's listed. It's public. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Okay. Boom. So now Very everybody good. can see my email. So that's cool. Um, how do you see it from? It's the only thing is the audio. Really. Uh, do you want me to check with me? It's it's working. So I think we are just start from. <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm here to present some work we've been doing over at Imperial in London uh, with these institutions. Uh, basically, we're um, kind of validating and testing an emulator for the hand camp that's going to be going up with the XMR rover in 2020. So, we're taking it out to the field, imaging the outcrops, and working out how to best use the stereo that we can get and the 3D rendering from what we have. This is the uh, XMR that put the front and front rover. We've got the, the pen come up there. Uh, it's basically a stereo camera on a two metre high mast, and this is used to basically collect the imagery in the rock art box as it um, kind of continues on its traverse. And then we can use some 3D processing techniques to render these images into 3D models and then basically do geological measurement from them. So we can look at the dimensions of the features, we can look at the different strike which is grain size and so on, and we're working on developing more advanced tools at home. And we basically use these tools to reconstruct the geological history of the area. Uh, we want to select and uh, place into context <coughs> the uh, contact science instruments, particularly the drill, which XMIs will have. So we're looking to drill up to two meters deep in the subsurface. And this is all aimed at focus and set for like what you know about geology and where we're more likely to find life on Earth to focus where it may become on Mars. So we took uh, an emulator for the pen pen to the top of this mast. 
and a robot developed by uh, Oxford University out into the Utah desert. So as you can see, it's a very nice uh, Martian-like landscape. Uh, it's very kind of remote and very hard to uh, communicate. So kind of an ideal situation to test a rover mission and collect a lot of data and validate that data. So we have the an emulator called the Aberystwyth University Pentan emulator, so at Aberystwyth University, and we we'll on top of that rover, and then we basically simulated uh, mission operations on a daily basis over about nine four or nine days. Uh, where we have a, an operations team in the mission control center in uh, Harbour in the UK, and they were looking at the images and data that we sent back and then telling the rover where to drive next take images of and what kind of scientific things they want to do. And we also use it as an opportunity to test the instruments and collect as much data as we could. So we process these uh, stereo images into ordered point clouds, uh, which is a specific format used in Pro 3D, which is the software that we use. And uh, <coughs> yeah, it's got additional validation data to measure the this is the Aberystwyth University Pancan emulator. It's got a 50 centimeter fixed baseline, so it's nice and wide. It's got two wide angle cameras on each end with a 38 degree field of view. And then a high resolution camera uh, between those, and it's all situated on a pencil unit, so you can get quite large panoramas. Uh, you program it in, and it kind of takes a mosaic. Uh, so we basically take these 3D reconstructions, uh, which are down here, and we place them on a 5 meter resolution DTM of the area, and then we put a um, 50 centimeter satellite imagery on top of that, <coughs> and basically rendered it all in 3D, and we put it all into the context we located where the Images were taken using localization data developed by the mission operations team. And then we can basically roam around the images as though it's just kind of a better environment to look at these images. Otherwise, you're looking at 2D panoramas on a flat screen, and it gives you a much better sense of depth and distance. And you can measure distances to features of interest, these small outcrops close to the rover, and we can see how far they are, and this helps us prioritize. Look at, I don't know how clear it is, but in the distance here you can see a ridge of uh, resistant rocks with quite a distinctive layer in it. It doesn't come out too well here, but it's actually dipping very slightly together. And we can use a lot of these features to kind of hypothesize what the sedimentary environment might have been, together with grain size information and comparison with uh, orbital imagery and stuff like that. So these dotted lines here are where we can measure some uh, dip and strikes. So we can also, if you've got uh, what's called cross bedding, which is one where you have migrating dunes in a desert or in a river, you measure the dip and strike of these dipping laminations and work out which direction these sediments may have moved in. So it's all a work in progress. We're only, we're only out there in uh, November last year. And we've been working on geo referencing all the data and sticking it all in one place. And then we're just working on piping up some of the artifacts and kind of comparing the measurements with what we have in the So we're finding, like, we've done a lot of this work with uh, existing Mars data that we've taken from the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity Rover, we've taken from the uh, mayor rovers opportunity so we're taking those um, techniques that we've been developing and we're going to be applying this to future missions and we've seen that it's really useful to it's much easier than taking measurements from both graphs and you've got a nice high resolution on everything so it really gives you a, an extra bit of detail in your observation uh, field trials as well as future um, kind of excursions that we're doing a uh, really good opportunity to test how reliable these re stereo reconstructions are, what kind of variables we can expect, and what's the best strategy for collecting images and so on. Um, we're also looking to develop 
quite more um, complicated and um, advanced geological tools. And we want to look at the limitations of the camera system, we want to look at the limitations of the 3D viewer. And yeah, as I was saying, it's all kind of in preparation for the 2020 XMR 2020 rover and also uh, software and process the viewer and the processing software are all being used for the NASA Mars Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any question for Rob? Thank you. Have you thought about, I know the, the Burr Rover team has started looking at like HoloLens and VR, does, you know, Pro, Pro 3D is going to fit into that? No, we're, we're talking about it at the moment. Uh, we may, we've got another couple of um, uh, Rover trials potentially coming up. We're still waiting to hear if we've got funding. Do you think it's going to be? Uh, it's easy to use and it gives you a much better sense of place and scale and stuff like that. So it's, it's not essential in my opinion yet, but it will be useful. Um, just, just in my Thanks a lot, Rob. So then we move to the next speaker, who is actually a fantastic lot. And. Uh, that's perfect. Oh. Good morning, everybody. I would like to talk today about the mapping of North events uh, on Mars. So we did that work in the last few years uh, during uh, an international space uh, science uh, uh, institute uh, project. Uh, at uh, Bern City. Uh, we are a few set of uh, researchers from different uh, European cities working on uh, that uh, I need to, to, to do a detailed map of the north end of Mars. And uh, so there is a French team, a uh, German team, English team, and uh, I will uh, try to summarize uh, that uh, research program. I'm not able to reach that uh, workshop. So, uh, so that's the uh, polar projection of the the, uh, the northern uh, plane of Mars. And that's the dichotomy of Mars here. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, there are uh, many interesting uh, uh, pictures uh, observed and, uh, on those uh, northern plains, like these uh, scarred terrain, these uh, rampart craters, these, these unknown. Uh, uh, domes here on the vocally uh, picture there. And all of these uh, pictures are supposed to be a very mature or natural pictures, even for the vocally ones. And uh, one of uh, the main uh, scientific goals of that uh, plan of mapping concerns the, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, the, the climate of Mars and the permafrost, the ice which permafrost, which may control the distribution of these. Uh, 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 long forms. So, so we use uh, for that uh, many uh, uh, images. And there are the, the so famous CTX images with a high resolution image, and there are thousands <coughs> thousand of images for, uh, for these North Atlantic, and we use also the laser altimeter for the topography. So, uh, that's uh, the beautiful map uh, from Kentanaka, uh, from USGS, Pakistan. Uh, that was uh, performed during uh, the late emissions and updated with uh, new images. These are regional uh, scale uh, geological map. And, uh, and we use, uh, you can see that the coverage of these uh, CTS images are quite good, even for a small portion, of, a large portion of the North Atlantic, that's a swap between the 20, uh, 30 degree north to uh, 80 degree north here. And uh, so uh, we try to, to, to propose a new uh, data, uh, mapping of these uh, northern plants using all of these. Uh, yeah. So for that, we selected uh, three uh, main uh, spots, the uh, Arcadia Panicia, the Topa Panicia, and Asidaria Panicia between 20 to 80 uh, degree north here. And, uh, uh, and we did that uh, separately with uh, three main teams, a French one team, uh, a German team, and an English team. 
independently, and then we we uh, present uh, each other the, the results uh, every year at the uh, at the Bay of City at the International Trade Salon uh, City. So uh, with the mapping uh, stripe uh, was divided in the 15 by 150 degrees of squares, of each of our 20 by 20 kilometers. And we use mostly the city image. So here is the, the grid mapping solution uh, used for that uh, uh, project. Uh, the grid mapping uh, is a quite a powerful and efficient approach that allows the systematic, systematic identification of the main uh, uh, land forms observed on those uh, northern plants. And we, uh, we use the Cassini projection, uh, which is uh, centered on the center of each of these uh, stripes here, um, because there are some minimal distortions when uh, we look at the, uh, these uh, stripes between uh, 20 degrees to 80 degrees. Yeah, that's the best uh, uh, projection. Uh, that's a typical overview of what is going on. Uh, that's uh, the 20 by 20 kilometer uh, square. Um, we selected the different uh, uh, typical long <coughs> observed on these uh, northern plants, uh, like uh, bullies, plastic uh, ball, uh, fishers, broccoli, um, chalets, uh, pits, uh, kilometer polygon, and so on. And then we look at the frequency of occurrence of each of these long plants with the uh, presence of these long plants. Uh, number one, the number two corresponds to the high, pre, uh, high frequency occurrence of that uh, rock forms and zero to the absence and uh, no data, uh, no, uh, no, 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 so that's the uh, geological uh, map from uh, the USGS. And the color corresponds to the, here the pink one uh, uh, corresponds to the presence, the high concentration of land forms. And here are the different land forms selected for Victor Pernicia, Julie's, uh, Montreal Deposit, Texture, Polygon, and so on, country. And you can see the concentrations of these uh, for each small square of 20 by 20 kilometer square. Huh? Uh, the presence and uh, concentration of each of these land forms here. And you can see that there are a quite good occurrence of the texture on metal deposits uh, for some selected latitudinal like, bonds, and some concentration here of uh, polygon pits and scale terrains, which are supposed to be high switch uh, land forms associated with the making of sublimation of uh, the high switch permafrost. And some other land forms which are uh, definitely different from these, uh, the, these ones. So uh, we did that. Uh, um, so sorry. Uh, so if, if we we uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, superpose all of these individual uh, swaps, uh, we can have uh, that uh, uh, image here, yeah, that map, the detail map, of all the concentration of these individual rounds. It's a quite difficult uh, uh, interpretations, uh, but uh, for the detail. Uh, uh, analysis, we can have some very interesting information about the, the effect of the, the effect of the geology versus the climatic influence for each of these uh, rock forms. So finally, uh, we can say that the, the grid mapping uh, is a part of a powerful and efficient process uh, for the so important uh, huge information, uh, the planetary image, cities images. And it uh, can be uh, easy to, to do it uh, with the ARGIS uh, software. And it provides a quite good solution for the, the problem of large scale geomorphological uh, mapping. So, thank you so much. So, uh, Thanks for the conversation. Any question, Francois? Um, what about the dictionary of features that you? Show them in the table. Is that something that comes from, for example, a template from a development? Is something that the map first proposed from time to time? Yeah, good point. Uh, the, the, one of the, the, the first meeting we did at the Mercedes was about that. The, the, the Cassini projection or not, the kind of mapping uh, techniques. And then we, uh, for each uh, area, Utopia, Kaya, Utopia, we looked at, uh, you know, we, we did a three separate group with our and we selected the main non-forms 
and we uh, did a very uh, detailed uh, definition of these allotments. And uh, we did a, a, a world uh, uh, template about uh, all of these allotments with the image, set, from set of images sent to the free groups. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so, so uh, individual researchers are, uh, are aware about the the uh, the, uh, the typology, uh, the classification of these uh, plants, and uh, to, to be sure that we will, we will not do some mistake about the interpretations. And then uh, during the second and um, uh, third meetings, we compare our uh, approach to be sure that, uh, for example. Uh, uh, a basketball uh, picture or um, scale picture is uh, the, the, the good one to be sure that uh, that's a very important uh, in order to then to uh, compare the different uh, uh, area on the map. No more questions. Not, if there is another more question, uh, we can leave the stage uh, uh, to Mario. No more. Okay. <laughs> 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 The idea behind it, we started analyzing from second and then we come up with this a little bit bigger overview. What they've done is try to use it, reusing special data. So, not the choice special data, then we should go to this pointer here as well. Yes, the upper button. Yeah, okay. So, we may, mostly use a messenger point special data mass data. So, for the one we use, definitely don't know how they could be partly used. We try to combine with other data set, and then we last year try to apply, apply the same approach to some more imaging data, but we always use that as a spectrum data mostly. So the idea that we, what we have done is try to define some surface units based on different data. So spectral data, in this case most spectral spectrometer data, X-ray spectrometer data in terms of chemical composition of the surface, and for those was just for spectral data. Um, the point was when we gather all the data together, was try to differentiate different areas of the surface, and that was done. When you hear about two D problems, really easy in the scatter plot, and you try to identify different areas with different densities in different problems. If you have 3D, you can do it with 3D visualization, and you can split the hand. But if you start to have something like two or three hundred features, it's really hard to visualize these different groups and try to separate them. So we start to use a systematic approach using um, machine learning as a different algorithm to try to identify and tell what these different are, are on, and why they are similar or different. And then this is all done without any special information in the learning phase. What we do is try to identify homogeneous units in the data, in the data space, and then visualize the units on the surface. So all the special information comes from the fact that the uh, units exist, they are visible in the visual space, they are spectral features or chemical figures, and they are current on the surface. So we can see the currents, the morphological currents in the spectral data, in the spectral space of the data. <coughs> Going on, that's one of the examples of the data here. You see all, each one polygon is of the data point. And what we have done, we build up a database of all the, of all the data that we have, and we try to start to identify. This was a, it's just an example. One of the guys working with us to start to make some morphological mapping, and we try to investigate this area defined from the user with the data, this bunch of data. What we come with is this thing. So all the data contained in this small polygon that the user defined, and then we can gather all the spectral data together and plot for you different color and different data here. So uh, the reference area is red one, with some addition everything. So you have a better definition what your units on the surface are defined, are in terms of spectrum and the variance. So if they are current or not current and so on. Using the same approach, we produce a 
not using per hand written or uh, drawn feature. We use uh, something like you show. So our global grid, in this case, is one per one degree. And we gather all data together. So after we make a record of the old data on the old surface. In this case, you're looking at the power nanometer reflectance chromatic. There are a bunch of holes, but I guess now, this is a bit of this image. Now it's mostly complete. And there are some uncalibrated fashion work for you. You know, you, you can move yeah. the the uh, yeah, some uncalibrated data, like it's uh, used to it, but mostly some not correct and affected. Should be <coughs> accounted for in the last work that we are working on for the problematic calibration of the data. So if you translate this thing on the surface, you got to be right there. So behind there is the base map from the imager, and on top there's a spectrum data. So you see there is some special correctness, so you start to see, yeah, there's a basin, for example, the inner part of the basin, there's colors here, it's mostly red, but we have a little bit less reflectance here, and different stuff on the surface. So now we have a couple of hundred layer of different data. Try to understand if there are some spectral units on surface. So, apply in this case, a really simple algorithm for this thing. You see something? On the live stream, is much better. Okay. So, for posterity, yeah. just to let you know. Let's switch here. Um, this is uh, this, wait, it's the same pixel you've seen before, but each pixel is just telling you the different color, telling you which unit this pixel belongs to. So, we have something red here that are the same region here, here, and the top. And this north region, for example, is similar to this, was for the northern smooth plane that were identified in basic, basic on morphological studies. And this region here is a deep region. Okay, the color in this case we get to the blueness or the redness of the, of the spectrum. So the red region got the redder spectrum, and the blue region has bluer spectrum. In the case of the moon, for example, it links to maturity of the surface. In this case of microgravity, the system is a little bit complicated because there are different processes going on. And in some cases, so the weathering, for example, is going to redden your spectrum, but there are some processes linked to the UV that's going to make it bluer. Plus, on the top, we have a mercury, a higher camera gradient going to something like 200 Kelvin in the deep night to five, more than 500 in the day. So the mineral processor, just we got to the sun. Some of those are done like sulfur that we are traditionally on surface, were exploded and burned. And then with some UV processing, we just start from the crystal structure here to the surface. So you balance between two things. And there are some examples of what I mentioned before of this structure. Structure come apart in our classification without any special information yet. So we start to see. The interior of the basin, the ring here, and the outside are uh, all different basin <coughs> reddish in this case. And that's the same thing, just using the chemical data and not the spectral data. And you see different <coughs> homogeneous chemical problems on the surface. But just based on two decals of magnesium and aluminum P silica, because we don't have an update of all the old surface. That was from Mercury. Just really quick for the data that on Vesta we took. Data cube, and we use each single image, each single image on it as a spectrum, and we use that to classify using different algorithms. The idea was to get the data as they come in, and we classify each single cube along all the classes that are present in a cube, and then we gather all the classes together to make a homogeneous <coughs> and global class. And, and you see that gathering all the data together, you start to increase the number of classes here, but you can upgrade them decrease. Gathering all the cluster together and making classification on the cluster. But there are some points where we get uh, always more points than the other. It means actually that we are looking at the new place on the surface and all the pixels uh, don't belong to the cluster. <coughs> and then gathering everything together, you can make a hierarchical cluster, you cut in here in the original fashion. You can take different, in this case, here you have three different branches of different things on the surface. And to show to show you what we've got in this case, it's a zoom of the Venetian, I guess, in there. Okay. And we found two regions that you cannot see on this map, but there's two small regions here. Trust me, that are where published paper found out from a polyline. 
So we found two independent homogeneous classes in fact of this place. Thanks a lot, Mario. I think we have to move on to the next door, but if there's one single question, yeah, because I need to switch that. Should we have Mario? If not, you can add uh, uh, time. Okay, quick. Uh, now you're next. Okay, quick. I don't know if it's quick. Uh, if you have a single value, what else are you, are you also saving like the range of the data? <coughs> or that's because of whether that's alpha or low end or what other data are you? You mean for the classification or the classification? You have you are you saving everything that the internet possible? Yeah. I mean yeah. okay, it depends on which data you put in. And you mean if I if I want to identify where this pixel is in this class? Yeah. You can you can receive it other one. I mean you put everything you, at the end what you do is when you find a class to represent the class, you make something the average, for example, the mean or the median, whatever you want to, to represent the class, but there are variance inside. So you that. Yeah, yeah, it's everything that I mean. I just tell, I mean, what I get normally is just the, the labels, and I know each pixel which label it has, and then I can compute everything I want. But I can actually see, I can plot just this class, one of the parameters or two, and then pick out the pixel that I'm interested in and see if there's the border in between. Normally, these are going to compact the glasses, and you should not have a huge variance. But it depends on many glasses. So if you, if you try to catch the whole planet with two glasses, you will have a huge variance. If you have 100 glasses, you have a small variance, but too many glasses will make a huge variance. So you have a trade-off between the two things. Thanks a lot, Mario. Are you interested in another aspect? Because you know, uh, the Ryan and uh, presentation is up. Uh, Mario, the microphone. Oh. Can you share it? <laughs> Otherwise, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my PhD topic is completely different from what I'm going to now. So, I basically work with the towards the first level of data volume and then that is the knowledge of the three rooms, mass, and the other system of the data set. So, why fresh data? Why am I talking about fresh data? So, it is important to me. Okay, this is, I start something started to work on my own. My friend Shukri, she's, she's also been a PhD at Oslo. If you support from this, you can help her. So, okay, why fresh data? Let's go back to four billion years of me, so we have press, which is available from the surface. And then we have one billion years, we have a buffer flow, buffer flow. And over the years, obviously, there will be more so again. Let's say that like another two, from the two billion years, we have another buffer flow <coughs> and another record. So, if I want to study the proportional evolution of new buffer flow over time in this area of interest, I need to see the neurology of this buffer flow and then this buffer flow. But from an orbit, all I see is a regular surface which covers the assorted units. And the regular is not really one to one match of the surface of the liquid, it is a mixture of materials from the near the inner and the high mass. So it is not a true spectral match for the surface we are doing. So in order to study the buffer flow, uh, we need to look. For us, it's a small craters, which just removes the anomaly and exposes me the muscle, the muscle flow I need. So if I want to study this muscle flow, all I need to put is a bigger crater, which scoops this material up. So when I have an end cube, for example, an end cube spectrometer on this orbit, you can see, get the spectra from these crater surfaces that I'm actually looking at these muscle flows. But the question is, am I really looking at the spectrum of these buffer flows? Because the, the material on this surface is formed from the solidification of a milk at high temperature, high pressure. Whereas the buffer flow is just a natural crystallization of volcanic lava on the surface. How spectrally the this if, if it takes if it takes those buffer flow in hand, 
just hammer it, take it and take a spectra, which does be equal to the spectra that we take from the impact spectra, which is a big question. So we have to understand that we have to really understand the impact morphology of these fresh craters and how mineralogy relates with every impact feature on these fresh craters. So let's go for a, a fresh crater, so you can just be a 5 kilometer diameter. It's a, okay, it's not very well in the, it's a very beautiful crater having whatever impact feature you want to see on an impact crater you see here. Like you have a very beautiful mill flows here, you have concentric uh, shock, shock um, falls over here, and this. Okay, if, if, if you can really see, you can actually see some kind of. Maybe 10 years ago. For example, okay, in this case is an ocean structure, we know the thickness of lava is approximately 16 meters, 16 meters. And the, the five kilometer crater, so all we are seeing like five and a meter deep. So that may have the buffer flows of only billions of years. And this page is like dated to be like something similar. And if you take if you take a spectrum from each morphology, you need of this impact feature and compare with the general double melt flow of melt flow. So just focus on the yellow spectra. Is this other spectra really equal to equal to of all the other spectra of the paper? I'm looking at the same region, same metro, same pattern, but same improved data, nothing is different. Why are we seeing this mineral difference? So it is particular to this pattern or all, all single such craters on you. So both such craters and such craters on you. So when I, I use this crater, you will get a catalog and just um, collected the crater, which is just between three to six kilometers, and also having a very fresh simple crater morphology. So 41 craters out of 1356 craters have very fresh morphology only. And you can see most of them, okay, some of them are ocean stress ladder, and maybe everything is similar minerals or similar basaltic uh, volcanic history of new regions. And these yellow spots, they are not really between 3 to 6, they are something like 2.5 and 6.5, a bit closer. So this is the nature of the what we study. So let's take a look at crater. It's very close to the of and it also has a very good, was a very good impact feature. It's registered, and it's a 6.5 kilometer crater with 34 million year age. Okay. So what I want to know, I want to know the morphology and mineralogy correlation for all these interpreters, and also the age to know what is the age span for the um, Greater to lose its impact morphology units. To do that, I have to download like huge, huge data sets, a huge like, data sets. And it, it, it's a feasible work, but it's, it's a very time consuming work. So, what I want from here from this workshop is any web based solution that actually, you know, make me like take a from the region to give me the MQ data for the region. And just give me the land data for the region so that I can easily go map. And any open source data reduction, we know there are lots of algorithms for automatic data reduction, but they are in so it is not freely available. I'm aware that LMMP has the data reduction algorithm for the upper 15 units, but not for the whole unit. So if we have any tools for open source tools that anyone can use for automatic data reduction, because this will really reduce. Look, I want to find the age for all the possible craters. So you can have it. It's the thing. So anything which should be subscribed. Thank you. And thanks. Time for some quick questions. If not, we have lunch time, coffee break, and other non-standard results. Thanks a lot, Tina. Uh, the next speaker is Anthony. Anthony. And uh, <laughs> Do you see it on? Yes, we know. It's on. Okay.
par le droit. Donc, monsieur, messieurs, la deuxième interface est une opportunité qui est due au travail de CS, qui est la plus distincte de Google. Could you talk some about that? I don't think about um, Martian Control Database, which is um, five years ago by Robbins, short of it, and it's uh, the most complete Control Database from Mars. It contains more than uh, 300 million projects, uh, larger than one kilometer. And for projects larger than three kilometers, we have topographic, morphometric, and morphologic. Uh, data so it's a very complete um, database and we have to reduce by using things like that it's one of the new competition and uh, all quarters uh, were manually modified and measured but there is two problems with uh, this database the first one is that when you want to download it you have the choice between uh, five uh, types of window um, to more or less uh, data, more or less information. And the first one is, uh, the first number is added for edge dating. But when you download this um, database, you are, it contains uh, a large number of secondary quarters and just quarters, and you have to exclude it um, to date uh, the Martian subjects. So it's not added to edge dating. And the second problem is false detections. There is a lot of false detection in this database. Um, uh, there is one. Um, you can see a raw image, you can see an image from our interface. And here, the raw is the database. And all white products are in the database, but do not exist. So we have to review uh, the entire database, and we propose to, um, to review. Um, this database by manual checking of each quarter. And we propose to categorize them to experience secondary quarters and ghost quarters to adapt uh, this database to HJT. Um, so we need to collaborate with as many people as possible because there is a lot of quarters in this database and we have to create a shared goal and a standard to, uh, to decrease uh, the checking time uh, for each quarter. So uh, we have added the planning salary data year of season um, for more details. Uh, Omar Bella talked about that recently. And here it's the interface. Uh, you can see all points, all yellow points uh, are in the drawings database. And we have to close up on each quarter uh, to uh, classify uh, <coughs> five categories. Um, we have cuts and we have to make it into one word for two quarters, one word uh, and we distribute them to all participants. So it's a lot of work, but uh, this will provide a really uh, big speed of 1,000 quarters per hour. And uh, we have 32 researchers and 43 students who work on it. So we have 75 uh, reviewers on the team. And you can see here the distribution of uh, each participant. And the number here is the number of projects on, uh, on each part. Uh, on us. Um, the north uh, is, um, has been uh, done already. And we have to finish uh, the review for this uh, part of the database. And more than five, four uh, thousand false detections have been, have been found just for the northern uh, part, the northern answer. Person to approximately uh, five percent of false detections. So uh, we plan to distribute the review database um, at the beginning of the summer, just after the previous meeting. And the so database will be available, a global database with and without uh, false decisions, and a database related to HDT without just and secondary practice. Uh, Using Cesium Viewer is very useful because it includes the capabilities of the collaborative work and facilitate the choice between all collaborators by decreasing uh, 
what inside, and we use it not only one file extent. Um, we have the possibility to add that to the interface for this project. We can imagine a location for the PC project, and maybe for creating a series of updates for the entire uh, machine interface. So, thank you. And here is the timeline of the project. It was very quick to open the final world. Hello. I request Trent. Trent is the serial uh, questioner. Trent, uh, Sebastian, and Ramiro in our game. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that you're testing somebody's database. And, and I think we, we've had some of the folks never, never done a systematic check. So we found it in order to test 10% here. So 10%. Oh, what's the predictions? Or for the northern plains. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm really happy to see this. I think. So the one last thing I'll say is I would love to see from this study a, a very well-documented area that we can use for automatic trigger finding tools and so basically a very well-defined to test against people and computers. Yeah, it's the next step. I think uh, when we have the manual um, quarter of the days, we can uh, plan to uh, to apply an uh, automatic uh, control detection and uh, compare <coughs> to the domain. So we need to have that. We need to have that very well checked database before you can say whether your yeah. computer algorithms are good. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Sebastian? So just to, to complete so your, uh, uh, we plan to, to do, um, sorry, no, you think you should look this to uh, area. Here and there. There is three reviewers, and we want to compare the results of a reviewer of one reviewer. Uh, uh, yeah, a review of three reviewers to um, know the, the objectivity of the city because it depends on uh, the reviewer and the day the moon. <laughs> Lots of factors. <coughs> Because uh, I would rather mark them somehow um, that's a highly debated topic. And if you ask three different people who are to create a company, we feel that they will give you three different answers. What is a secondary uh, People who are, they claim they can see these secondaries all over the planet from one yeah. a primary impact on your right. That's the database that we use uh, is for purposes that are built on one kilometer. And the purpose at this area are more easy to recognize than the little ones. Uh, they have an um, elevated morphology. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the traffic density where they are is very high, so you can recognize. But then, if you keep them in the database, people will not think that you forgot something. Or something just oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, like a perfect database doesn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> but we said just uh, that we. we Erase all four predictions and we improve uh, a little bit. <laughs> we improve them a little bit. We got some debate, so we can debate for a lot of uh, things. <coughs> Would that be like a shape file? Would that be uh, yeah, tangible? Um, I think we we want to build this database available into many formats, many yeah. extents. JPY, uh, GeoJSON. We use GeoJSON five for this uh, review for this project. So yeah, okay. <laughs> it's important to not convert. The, the file that you don't know to use it so we do the job. Uh, yeah.
Thanks a lot. Well, good. I haven't read it, but I think there's an abstract on the problem with the database. Let me see. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. I told that that's really good. And she said that Robin's cluster database has almost 20% of all the detections, but I think it's too much. Too much. Yeah. 5% is a good approximation, but not 20%. So the next speaker, thanks a lot, Anthony. The next speaker is Omar Dela, and uh, we are sharing your thoughts. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Omar Dela, and I'm the Chief Scientist for Science and Development of uh, OMGs for Science. And um, so our aim is very simple, it is to develop uh, a simple tool, a simple tool, for, I'm sorry, uh, very easy to use uh, in order to make easier uh, collaborative work inside the community. So uh, we decided to develop a tool uh, by considering four points. The first one is that, sorry, uh, is that this tool must be able to visualize planetary data in 3D inside a browser. That means that you don't have to install it in your machine. You will just have to go in a, in a website to use this tool. Then uh, this tool must take into account a planetary standard. Uh, this tool must uh, offer to the user to use basic gist like tools to explore data. And finally, this tool must offer the possibility to merge data, local and distant data, uh, in the same screen. For example, I, uh, I would like, for example, to use maps from the uh, USGS. Uh, thanks for sharing this data. Um, and for example, I would like to put on this maps uh, virtual observatory from uh, Paris, for example, or Jacob University. Uh, to develop these tools, we we use the, uh, the CESM framework. The CESM framework is uh, an open source framework developed in JavaScript. And this uh, CESM takes into account several uh, web technologies, web research technologies, such as uh, Knockout, Node.js, Require.js, <coughs> and other, uh, other uh, technologies. But the most important thing is that is that uh, WebGL is based on WebGL technology. That means that WebGL will use a uh, processor of your machine, but it will also use the graphical card. And this makes Cesium application very fast. The aim of Cesium is to create a based blog in 3D and maps, so 2D and Columbia's view, 2.5D for visualizing data, dynamic data. Uh, if you are interested uh, by Cesium, you can see some example in this, uh, this website. And here I just put the official website of Cesium. Uh, we called this tool Planetary Cesium Viewer. And in this slide, I summarize uh, some characteristics uh, of this tool. The first one is that uh, this tool is a customizable application. Uh, I mean that um, we can, for example, uh, decide which planet or satellite we would like to see or not, and we can define uh, the size of each body because we can model each body as a three axis history. Planetary Sodium Viewer uh, take into account a coordinate reference system of each body of the solar system dynamically. Uh, we have implemented basic GC functionality and we can save your data as a geodesign file. And we can also make a classification of entities such as uh, John uh, Anthony in his work with uh, a system track. 
and we began to uh, implement uh, a visualization of video data. And uh, actually, we are able to, uh, to request data from Paris Observatory, Heidelberg University, and Jacobs University. Uh, here, I just, would, uh, just would like to present to you some screenshots of the application. And from my point of view, uh, we can see planetary system viewer as a virtual, planet, uh, a virtual planetarium. Uh, you can see a lot of objects of the solar system if it's available. Uh, here, just to, to show you uh, that we can uh, plot directly inside uh, uh, we can plot directly on Mars uh, some basic uh, tools such as circle, uh, lines, polygon, and show some information. For example, here's a diameter, here's a distance between two points, the total distance of your line in red. Uh, uh, the flight consistency system. So you can uh, you can build your own uh, your own layer and you can save it and share it to all other people to have a uniform uh, legend for your collab collaborative work. Here I just uh, pay your attention that you can also uh, see several uh, several uh, layers and we can switch easily between planet and satellite. Uh, here just a use case <coughs> of the virtual uh, laboratory. I get the, the case of that. Uh, I, you, show, uh, you, you can see here uh, data from Paris Observatory in, in yellow and uh, uh, Edelberg University data in the green. And uh, here you can see a lot of information when you're clicking on one of the points. Uh, if you are interested to play a little bit with the application, you can find it in this address. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Any question? Trend. I, I was asking for it almost. So, so, so using the, using the WMS mm -hmm. what do you need to use for 3D for, for topography? Uh, what kind of service do you think you need? I don't know. Thank you. Next, speak. Yeah, Mira, So you define the components in the three <laughs> Yes. And then the CRS, you use also like minor axis, major axis, or you use a uh, NSD? To define the CRS? Yeah. Uh, I just mm -hmm. use um, uh, a paper in which we have uh, a way to dynamically. Uh, Generates the CRS. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, this is uh, the train paper. Uh, yes. So it's your fault, train, or your merit. I don't know. Maybe it's the train. Yeah. Maybe it's the train. Yeah. Okay, but this will be a very good lunch uh, discussion, actually. To think on that, not to forget it. Thanks a lot, Omar. The next talk uh, um, is delivered um, on behalf of um, Francois Sivet yeah. by Maria Massé and in the pocket of the inspector. And it's up, you can use this thing. Sure. So, good morning. Uh, I am Francois Sivet, who has already seen it. Sorry to not be able to come.
that uh, as a collaborator of this project, I will try to present this project, which is uh, VR to connect, so VR for virtual reality, uh, an immersive tool for data visualization. So what is uh, VR to connect? So at the beginning, it was a real research project in virtual reality, uh, which took place in the territory of Jean-Denis Lab of France, and the lab by François Sillet and Stéphane Rodi. And since last October, it's beginning to, to be a real French startup, which is still hosted by a non laboratory that is a separate company, uh, but which works very uh, closely with a uh, uh, researcher. So the aim of this startup is to provide immersive tools for geoscience, geoscience and education. Uh, so what is the objective of the startup? It's to mobilize uh, inaccessible or sensible sites in an immersive showroom and uh, it provides a decisional making tool, so for example, uh, for inaccessible, inaccessible or not easily accessible site, it can help for the preparation of field trips, or for example, for some CSS site, it can help for the uh, selection of future learning sites and so on. <coughs> so, uh, these uh, tools can take place on Earth or, or, or on other planets like Moon, Titan, or Mars. So, uh, can you click on the screen? I hope it works. Yes, I think it does. One second. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so here we will see one of the last applications, uh, which is normally on Mars, yes. And uh, it was an application done for the IAS in Paris, and the objective was to provide a tool to help for, uh, for landing site decision. So it was, uh, the IAS asked for this tool for convince people that, that Mars Valley is a good landing site for Mars 2020 or the Mars. So it didn't work the right way for Mars 2020, but better for the Mars. So normally it's free, so I'm sorry, I hope it will work anyway. Uh, it's a progressive rendering, so first if you are far away, you have low resolution data, and when you go closer, you will have high resolution data. Maybe. And normally also it's in screen, and uh, you can visualize that in a deep screen or in a headset. Um, I hope to have at least some of the high resolution images. And uh, if you want a better radio with a free rendering, you can just ask me and I will show you in my laptop. Yeah, so this is the higher resolution we need to happen up here. I would like to stay very early on that. Okay, so you can visualize, so I can show you the better value because there is a very high resolution here in the IRL city. So, this application uh, is designed for different immersive device, device, so it can be a cave. So, you can see only three screens here, but there are four screens. Three here and one on the ground. Uh, it can be uh, just multi screen in 3D or a virtual reality headset like HTC Avive or Oculus Rift. And this uh, headset is multi users. Uh, that means that you can be here in Moscow and work on Mars in Moscow with your headset. And you can uh, talk about Mars and, uh, for example, curiosity site with someone in the US with the same headset and the same application. And you can just work together on Mars. And have a look at the geology and talk about the geology. So it's a powerful tool. So if you compare to uh, RG3D Google, you have a 3D real time uh, view, a 3D of rendering, can you click on this image? 3D of rendering, a full resolution image, and, uh, and as you can see, it's like, uh, again, a very small screen. And here the, the spatial shift is for fluidic exhibition. Uh, it's still catching the other uh, aggressive, but we are, we are uh, producing a new one uh, more exciting. <laughs> and finally, so uh, to the process from linear to uh, 3D virtual appearance is a uh, variety for patents. 
and uh, it's, it's based on, uh, on technology from Biogen. And the, 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 final, uh, the final objective is to have a GIS tool, so it works. So you can do some points to calculate the protein and volume from uh, the schools. And just to finish, some uh, awards from the open for this application. And then this is from the French minister. Thanks a lot, Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, this has to be like to like control things and stuff and it's uh, what? do you have a way to control for this kind of to for simple control lines or just yes 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 those are what I was showing just before just a very fast yeah. I'm not sure we can we can do and now but it's uh, Thanks a lot. So then I will say that we can move on to Prime Minister. And we are almost on time. Thank you. In the pocket, the things are going to be That's good. This is Lisa and slides. Good morning. Um, can you see me? Let me get it on this on the scarf. You should go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here and uh, the opportunity to present. Uh, so what's the same track? So it's uh, a project that, you know, I work with the team at uh, JPL for development of those web portals and also for the management of Accurate Games Service, which is stands for Solar System Exploration Virtual Research Virtual Institute. Um, and a lot of our products is actually uh, come from TREN from uh, USGS, so thank you for their contribution. So just a quick overview. Um, basically, what we have developed is the sets of uh, data products into every tool, which is through a web portal, um, and that's the technology for you know exploration of uh, different planet bodies. And specifically, we really want to support mission planning, such as learning cycle action pathfinding, as well as scientific research um, and also uh, public outreach education. So what we provide is a set of capability for visualizations, analysis, um, we could see the printing, um, and a whole bunch of data services allow you to be able to access our data products using uh, OGC standard. Um, so because of uh, using the standard, uh, we were able to uh, support a variety of external platforms such as the AI uh, solar system and different planetary tutorials and also um, support a number of different user interfaces. Um, for our set of portal, you know, um, we have a common infrastructure in the back end and also a common client framework, allowing us to be extendable um, and scalable so we can be able to support multiple planet bodies. Currently, we have an uh, uh, application for the Earth, the Moon, that's very dark, and we are um, doing some prototyping for the Phobos and also the 67 um, we have, um, we will be working on series and on top of the Earth as well. <clears throat> so this is just uh, to show that, you know, because of our, you know, using sets of standards, our data products can be already, you know, um, applied to uh, the web portals um, because we have the REST API. And we have a device such as Hyperwall, um, virtual reality goggles, immersive capability, and touch tables. So, um, for those who have attended uh, two years ago the uh, planetary GISS workshop, um, I had the opportunity to demonstrate LMSP, which is Luna Mapping Wildly Portal. 
Um, and since then, uh, and also MOS track as well as FD track. And since then, we have replaced the LMP by a new track. And um, we, we enhanced it um, for the NASA wide security compliance. So now it's HTTPS in terms of HTTP. Um, it's newly released on March 31st. So you would all be able to access it. Um, we have an improved user interface, um, particularly search capability in 3D and also in navigation. So we upgraded the back end to make it you know, easier for us to ingest data. Um, and we also developed the next processing pipeline. Um, so we'll be able to add in more new next uh, layers. Um, additional features include we used to have a, a STL generator, and now we have OBJ generator for 3D printing. Um, we have an EC3 capture for you to add your uh, images into your presentation or your um, paper. Um, we talked about that processing already. Um, we have worked on a rock detector and crater detector. Um, and also, we have a number of new products that are provided by Tree. So, uh, let's quickly uh, give your movie on that if you can stop that. This is just a quick view of what Tree Track is. So, you can display, you know, uh, different affairs um, in 2D format. Um, you can use Zoom and Pan to all the GIS capability. And you can do a search based on different classes. Uh, product type, um, missions, and teams. Um, once you select the, the uh, findings, uh, the products you have to add to the, to the layer so you'll be able to, to see it right there. Um, and you can zoom in and, and then right here. Okay, so, so there's one button screen capture capability that I've mentioned earlier. And now you can go to your different um, pick up the little tool. This one is the naturally tools. So you can find out the distance and then you can see the profile. You can draw a line or you know, or multiple lines. Um, and here is where you can you know, draw a line and drop anywhere in the surface and be close to generate an STL or OBJ file for you to get a data file to a computer and a lot of you will get a 3D model. Um, so we have different subsetting tools, work tools, different type of tools for analysis. So let's show them. And here is our 3D navigation um, capability. Um, it's based on Pentium. So you will be able to Add any layers that you select onto the base map and be able to basically fly across the surface of the moon. So I think that's the end of the movie, right? So there's so much of other capability. So feel free to go to the HTTPS, um, moonchecks.jpl.nasa.gov and before it, and I would welcome our any uh, feedback. So here is something that I want to show you something that we are currently working on with the prototype. This is the CG track. So you can see that it's, it's a regular shape. Um, what it's showing here is the spot there is the ball side uh, from the Rosetta uh, mission. Um, uh, basically, the instrument is Myra that we use. So we can see you know, over time where it's picking the data. Um, that's the web document the the world center. Um, this, this is also other capability is just so that we want to be able to allow you to change the the area of the uh, the view. That's so because of the site we can change depending on the uh, space application. Um, and also you can change different colors as well. So this is something that you now we are currently working on. We're hoping that we'll be able to get uh, different type of maps to be able to overlay on top of this, just like the new track. So, I mean, if I may interrupt with the question, it would be wonderful to talk with, to, for example, with Angelo and Matisse and, and maybe have this uh, VO compatible. Yeah. That would yeah. be very nice. Yeah. A very yeah. nice. Uh, actually, actually, you know, they, um, 
with me to all the conference and several people that I would like to connect with and, and perhaps work on this together. So the next one, the, the sample that I have going back, um, can we start this? Is the uh, photo traffic, another one that we, uh, we have worked on. So we can see that it's another irregular track. Um, so this is a particular <coughs> thing that we're asking us Do you uh, also have a link to show concrete or also in the we, we would like to work with a different type of data, so it all depends on you know where the data is available and what form of data are coming from. So we work with the GPL to Myro as a GPL instrument. So we will we will get some of the data, and also temperature data, we eventually will add to it as the time series temperature data sets. Um, I would like to be able to get all of our data products and add to it. Now, but it's not the challenging because of the shape, so that's not the amount of work to make it available. And maybe um, the, the thing with this uh, embedded will have a uh, web portal so you can use uh, the technology of the tool and um, the analysis capabilities. So there's some cross service. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what we would like to do is make it available on our web portals and then provide an analysis. As well as data products, so I wanted to have access to them, we should be able to make them available. So, one of the things that we would love to work with and really train and other people is how can we be able to have really a global registry of all the data sets that we would be able to access easily, um, have the standards that we can do access to all these community data sets as well as tools. Uh, I think you mentioned in the previous talk to your civil that you're using WMPS for streaming the images, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. For uh, are you using it uh, for the, the non-irregular bodies? Mm -hmm. 
Well, we hope that's the case. Uh, okay. We, we, right now, uh, we don't have those yeah. services yet. Okay. Well, we told them. But at some point, there will be public endpoint. Yes. Okay. Yes. When, whenever we make the, uh, the portal available, operational, or other data sets, we'll, we'll have endpoint. Okay, because in that respect, then uh, when we need to we show something, it could be relatively easy then to, to register them right. to the deal once the uh, OGC endpoints are there. Right. Thanks a lot again. It was very nice. Um, now we have nominally another two talks, but you also have nominally a break. Uh, since uh, uh, we can do two things, we can either have uh, one talk now and uh, delay the break, or since they're the, the scheduled and they're also scheduled internally at the hotel, maybe we can break here and we can move after the coffee break to talks. Chiara, what's your view on that? Is it okay? Can to, yes, basically, there is Nico presentation on complementary map and the presentation the remote, uh, delivered by Trent on behalf of Brent. Yeah, I can keep mine short. So, yeah, I can keep mine short. Too. So, so, I mean, so mine is quite. Maybe short now or later. No, it's up to you. Maybe you can. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's also where I was trying to go. So, I think that uh, that sounds good. And with this, I will uh, close the morning session. Thanks to everyone. And uh, go ahead, please. No, we can lock the door. And I will leave my stuff here. Yeah. You have the key. So if anything gets stolen, Tara will buy for us. Okay.